Buenas tardes. Vamos a iniciar el segundo panel de este seminario. Todos tienen... Voy a hablar en español. No sé si por la traducción. ¿Estamos bien? ¿Sí? Ok. Decía por la traducción para los compatriotas. Eh, Vamos a dar inicio al segundo panel de estas eh, jornadas. Eh, en la mesa me acompañan Jacob Weinrip, que es eh, estudiante de postdoctorado en NYU sobre Legal Studies, eh, el profesor Martín Aldao, que es profesor de la facultad y, e investigador en el Instituto eh, Gioja, que es el Instituto de Investigaciones Sociojurídicas de la Facultad de Derecho, y eh, voy a disculpar a la profesora Clérico que trabajó con el profesor Aldao en el paper que él va a presentar porque eh, está en este momento como profesora en Alemania y no le resultó posible viajar eh, para la conferencia. Con estas breves presentaciones esperamos que los colegas tomen asiento. Y eh, quién quiere... Ok, Jacob, entonces. Can everybody hear me? That's yes. And does everyone have a copy of the handout? Um, if you don't have a copy of the handout, will you move closer to someone who does? Um, I had 25 copies, which made the trip from Canada, so they're, uh, they're well-traveled. <clears throat> okay, so this paper focuses on a question that emerges at the intersection of the theory and practice of constitutional rights. What is the relationship between Dworkin's rights as Trump's model and proportionality, the leading doctrine of constitutional adjudication in jurisdictions around the world? Now, among scholars, the prevailing view is that Dworkin's model stands as a radical alternative to the doctrine. Scholars adopt this view for different reasons. Those who are sympathetic to proportionality often see the rights as Trump's model as a kind of rigorism that fails to acknowledge um, moral considerations that justify the infringement of constitutional rights. Those who are sympathetic to Dworkin's rights as Trump's model, in turn, often see the doctrine of proportionality as a way of diluting the categorical protections that rights afford to their bearers and as a way of subordinating um, rights-based principles to considerations of policy. Now, in this paper, I argue that the rights as Trump's model and proportionality do not stand in a relation of opposition, as is often supposed. Rather, Dworkin's model is an instance of the doctrine of proportionality. The doctrine consists in a set of conditions that government must satisfy in order to justify a law that infringes a constitutional right. Now, Dworkin doesn't speak in terms of proportionality or use its distinctive terminology, but he does explore cases in which rights come into conflict with other constitutional commitments. And when he does, he reaches for the very considerations or conditions that form the doctrine of proportionality. To see this, let's begin by exploring what Dworkin means when he refers to a right as a trump, when he calls rights trumps. To call a right a trump is to insist that it overrides certain kinds of collective goals asserted in the name of the public interest, including utility, policy, preference, administrative convenience, and non-prohibitive cost. This means that rights and collective goals of this kind do not, do not compete with one another on a common plane. Rather, any instance of a right prevails over any instance of a collective goal of this kind. Thus even when the marginal infringement of a right would make an enormous contribution to the reali realization of a collective goal, the right may not be curtailed. Now, while Dworkin takes the view that rights are trumps, he is adamant that rights are not absolute. He recognizes two kinds of considerations capable of justifying the infringement of a right. The first is an opposing right, and here his example is the law of defamation in which one person's right to free speech conflicts with another's right to their own good name, to their reputation. The second ground of limitation is what Dworkin calls a compelling reason 
And he glosses this idea of a compelling reason as a reason that is, quote, consistent with the suppositions on which the original right must be based. Um, these suppositions for Dworkin, as he explains in Taking Rights Seriously, but also elsewhere in his corpus, stem from notions of human dignity and political equality. Dworkin's recurring example of a compelling reason that um, rests in the moral suppositions underlying rights is an emergency, an occurrence that threatens the security of certain persons within the legal order, or that threatens the viability of the rights protecting legal order as a whole. Now this means that on Dworkin's view, rights stand in different kinds of relations to different kinds of objectives. Rights trump any objective that is extraneous to the moral considerations on which rights rest. But rights may be limited by other trumps, that is, by any objective that is itself an expression or an instance of the moral suppositions on which rights rest. If you take a look at um, the Dworkin's Rights as Trumps model column on your handout, um, I've formulated what I've said so far into the threshold condition. A government that takes rights seriously does not subordinate rights for the sake of realizing objectives that are extrinsic to the moral supposition on which rights rest. Now, once Dworkin accepts that rights can conflict with other trumps, a further question arises. What are the conditions under which a government that takes rights seriously would nevertheless be justified in limiting a right. Now, Dworkin doesn't offer a systematic reply to this question, at least to my knowledge. Um, but this is not to say that he doesn't have an answer. I think we can formulate an answer for him by looking to discussions in his corpus where trumps are alleged to conflict and to see how he treats them. So I'm now going to formulate three conditions on Dworkin's behalf that emerge out of um, these discussions. So a first condition arises out of a discussion in life's dominion surrounding abortion. And here I'm just going to read a quotation that appears on page 7 of the paper, if anybody wants to follow along. Dworkin argues that the state may not limit access to abortion on the grounds that, quote, a society in which abortion is tolerated is one that holds human life cheap, and that in that kind of society, ordinary people are more likely to be assaulted and killed. Obviously, it is a legitimate goal of society to protect people from murderous attack, but this argument is still unsatisfactory because a state needs a compelling reason to justify banning abortion and therefore strong um, evidence that the ban is necessary. And he goes on to explain that in this case, there's no evidence that restricting access to abortion would, re would um, reduce crime. So here Dworkin's argument takes the form. Protecting persons from violence is the kind of objective for which a right may be limited. It's a compelling reason that emerges from the suppositions underlying rights. But this objective is not actually advanced by limiting the right. Thus, to the extent that the right is infringed, the infringement is gratuitous, and rights are not taken seriously when they are gratuitously infringed. Now, this argument can be formulated in terms of a condition that would have to be satisfied to justify the limitation of a right. And so here we have condition one on the handout. A government that takes rights seriously does not limit rights for the sake of furthering a trump that the limitation does not advance. A further condition arises out of Dworkin's discussions of free speech. I think the clearest one appears in Freedom's Law, where Dworkin suggests that if it was true that some forms of pornography posed a clear and present danger to the safety of women, censorship of those forms would be justified, quote, unless less stringent methods of control, such as restricting pornography's audience, would be feasible, appropriate, and effective. So here we have a case in which there is a clash between the government's duty to respect free speech and its duty to provide security to all of its inhabitants. And in this case, our first condition is satisfied. Restricting free speech would contribute to safety. But the restriction would not be justified because the objective, safety, can be achieved while limiting freedom of speech to a lesser extent. This means that the limitation is, at least to some extent, gratuitous. It is more severe than the competing Trump can justify. And, as we saw a moment ago, rights are not taken seriously when they are gratuitously infringed. This um, set of considerations can themselves be formulated as a condition. And here I point you to condition two on the handout. A government that takes rights seriously does not limit rights to a greater extent than the competing Trump demands. 
Now, there's one final condition that I think we can find in Dworkin's writing, although I'm very interested in um, hearing if you think that there are other passages, particularly passages in which Trumps are alleged to conflict, that um, either fall within or without of this account. Um, in Is Democracy Possible Here, Dworkin has a long discussion about terrorism and human rights in the post-9-11 context. And he adverts to the wrongfulness of supposing, quote, that any act that improves our own security, no matter marginally, is for that reason justified. So here we have a clash between um, human rights and security. And we'll suppose that there is evidence that the infringement of human rights in the form of preventative detention advances security. Um, so condition one is satisfied. And we'll suppose further that there is no way to realize the government's security objective without infringing rights to this extent. So condition two is satisfied. And what I want to ask is, if these conditions are satisfied, can Dworkin still consistently hold that the government is acting wrongfully? Um, I think that he can, and we can see why by looking to his broader rights framework, with which I began. Recall that Dworkin understands all trumps, that is, all rights and all admissible bases for their limitation as instances of the state's duty with respect to human dignity and political equality. Thus, the moral suppositions that underlie discrete trumps offer a common standpoint for considering, on the one hand, the severity of a rights infringement, and um, on the other, the significance of a countervailing trump. Accordingly, we can ask whether these suppositions, these moral suppositions underlying rights, are furthered or frustrated by limiting the right. Connected with the example that we, we just canvassed, um, we can formulate Dworkin's claim as follows. The suppositions that underlie rights are not served by grievously infringing a right for the sake of a modest gain in security. And by generalizing on this point, I think we arrive at condition three. A government that takes rights seriously limits rights only in cases in which the limitation furthers the suppositions on which rights themselves rest. Now we can relate Dworkin's Trump's model to the doctrine of proportionality. The doctrine takes the various conditions that are scattered throughout Dworkin's corpus, and it consolidates them into a sequence for first, identifying cases in which Trumps conflict, and second, determining the duty of government with respect to conflicting Trumps. So let's take a look at our handout, and you'll see I've been working through the Dworkin's rights as Trump's model column. And now I want to consider the relationship between that column and proportionality, the, uh, the, right, the column on the right-hand side of the page. Now, I want to flag, before I continue, that there are different ways of thinking about the doctrine of proportionality. Different conceptions are available, and not all legal systems affirm the same conception. Some conceptions, I think, are closer and others farther from Dworkin's account. Here I simply um, invoke a prominent account that I think has a really strong affinity with Dworkin's project. But this is not to say that every conception of proportionality does. I'm really happy to talk about um, the discrepancies between the different conceptions um, in the question period, but um, I just want to flag that uh, at the present. Okay, so recall that Dworkin began with a threshold condition. A government that takes rights seriously does not subordinate rights for the sake of realizing objectives that are extrinsic to the moral supposition on which rights rest. Now, the language of moral supposition on which rights rest is, I think, um, something one doesn't often see in constitutional jurisprudence, and yet I think there are clear instances of that idea, albeit in different terminology. So my example is from um, the jurisprudence of the Supreme Court of Canada that I think poses um, an identical threshold con condition. Um, the Supreme Court of Canada doesn't refer to the moral supposition on which rights rest, but to the values of a free and democratic society, a phrase that appears in our Constitution. And um, it, the jurisprudence conceives of all rights and all justifiable limitations as instances of those values and principles. So here the threshold condition and the doctrine of proportionality is that objectives that are trivial or discordant with the principles of a free and democratic society are incapable of justifying the limitation of a right. And um, uh, appealing to this threshold condition, the uh, Supreme Court of Canada has excluded considerations um, that are of the very same nature that Dworkin regards rights as trumping, utility, preference, administrative convenience, non-prohibitive cost, and policy. Now, once this threshold condition is satisfied, um, the proportionality doctrine can then be applied, and it consists of three subtests. And what I'm going to suggest now is that each of these subtests 
runs parallel to one of Dworkin's conditions. Start with condition one. A government that takes rights seriously does not limit uh, rights for the sake of furthering a trump that the limitation does not actually advance. This, I think, is just the rational connection condition of the proportionality analysis. The rights infringing, uh, sorry, the rights infringing means that the law employs must be rationally connected to the relevant objective. Turning from condition one to condition two, um, I formulated Dworkin's idea as a government that takes rights seriously does not limit rights to a greater extent than the competing Trump demands. And this is, I think, um, parallel to the minimal impairment requirement of the proportionality analysis. The law must pursue its objective in a manner that minimally impairs the right. Now, once conditions one and two are satisfied, we have a situation in which if the right is realized undiminished, the conflicting Trump cannot be. And alternately, if the conflicting Trump is realized undiminished, the right must be infringed. And the question is, what is the government's duty with respect to this conflict, with respect to this clash of Trumps? I formulated Dworkin's, uh, what I take to be Dworkin's answer in condition three. A government that takes rights seriously limits rights only in cases in which the limitation furthers the supposition on which rights themselves rest. Now, appealing to um, the idea, uh, the values and principles of a free and democratic society as forming the moral suppositions on which all rights and all admissible bases of limitation, uh, from which all rights and all admissible bases of limitation proceed, I think the Supreme Court of Canada, in their formulation of the proportionality, proportionality analysis, arrives at the same condition. And so here's the, um, the bottom right box in the chart. The benefits which accrue from the limitation must be proportional to its deleterious effects as measured by the values of a free and democratic society. This means that in cases in which there's a genuine conflict between Trumps, such that both can't be jointly realized undiminished, um, the uh, court has to um, uh, realize the values that underlie the conflicting Trumps to the fullest possible extent. And this is what that condition requires. So I've argued that the rights as Trump's model and the doctrine of proportionality are not actually opposing views, but are actually instances of the same view, insofar as they seem to endorse the same condition for cases in which Trumps are alleged to conflict. By working out what it means to take rights seriously, Dworkin's model offers a theoretical basis for the doctrine of proportionality, even though he never really refers or engages to it. In turn, the doctrine of proportionality provides a way of ordering the piecemeal moral considerations to which Dworkin appeals in sort of scattered corners of his doctrine into a coherent legal, sorry, in scattered places in his corpus, into a coherent legal doctrine. It's a doctrine that does not require Herculean powers of adjudication to apply. I want to hear your views in a few minutes. Thank you. Hello. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, I'm presenting this paper in my name and Laura Clerico's name, who can be here. Okay. <clears throat> Robert Alexi claims to correctness thesis has been addressed mainly as an answer to the concept of law issue. In the, in, among the discussion between positivism and no positivism. In this presentation, we will firstly argue that the claim is better understood in the Dorkinian framework of legal adjudication. Secondly, we will argue that Alexis' reconstruction of adjudication in terms of justification rather than interpretation poses a less controversial comprehension of Dworkin's right answer thesis. Now, as a forewarning, we should point out that this is not an erudite analysis of both Dworkin and Alexis theories, but rather a reconstruction of some of their fundamental theses developed while teaching human rights case law. So we apologize in advance if other elements of the theoretical frameworks are not properly accounted for here. Alexis' claim to correctness theory is developed in order to address the question of the concept of law, more precisely to sustain the non-positivist thesis. Our perspective is quite another. We want to connect it with the process of adjudication. This is not the main point of Alexis' correctness thesis, 
although he was aware from the very first moment of her potential. We add that this potential is quite relevant in the process of adjudication in constitutional states, in those constitution and human rights treaties, where norms have not only the structure of rules, but also that of principles. The th this thesis, of, or the claim to correctness, was quite embryonic in the, th the first great book, of, or the first book of Alexi, The Theory of Legal Argumentation. On one hand, he sustained it because it was related to legal argumentation and legal decision making, and not law as such. On the other hand, we may add, because the model of norms in theory of legal arg argumentation was a model of rules and thus a model of adjudication in terms of subsumption, principles playing a marginal role only as a type of argument. This was the subject of his second book, The Theory of Constitutional Rights. In the argument from injustice, a reply to legal positivism, he defended the non-positivistic theory of the concept of law, based on the necessary relation between legal validity and moral discursive correctness. He developed three arguments under the participant perspective. The claim to correctness, the argument of extreme injustice, and the difference between rules and principles. The participant perspective and the first argument are important to hold our point. The first one said, you cannot play a game without participants. The participant perspective in the game of law is necessary. What does it mean from the participant perspective to play the game of law? Even if the answer depends on the role that you play, a, liar, a, a, liar, a lawyer, a judge, or a legislator, the key point is whether you are looking for the right answer rather than the actual given answer, which would put you in an observer role rather, a rather than a participant role. But let us take the participant perspective from the point of view of a judge. If you play by the rules of law, then you have to justify your decision. And if you have no clear and explicit legal argument to justify your decision, you still have to take a decision and to justify it as a result of an argumentative process. He admitted that the separation between thesis, between law and discursive morality is correct me, from the observer perspective, but not from the participant's view. We do not need to go into details here, the point being that his thinking about the relation of the participant perspective and the correctness thesis from the, standpoint, from the standpoint excuse me, of the law as a whole and not from the actual process of adjudication. That his thinking of law as a whole is pretty much clear in the actual phrasing used by Alexei. That the correctness thesis asserts that the law arises a claim in this sense and this includes a claim for moral correctness. This sophisticated version of the claim to correctness occurred in the general for the law as such. Although this approach is quite useful to understand legal interpretation as a collective enterprise, as we will try to show in the second part of this presentation, such a version is missing from the concrete cases and related to the participant perspective, leading many critics to dismiss Alexis' theory as a regression to natural law. In his first work, The Theory of Legal Arg Argumentation, Alexis sustained the thesis that the argumentation in law is an enterprise of rational argumentation, as this, as if this practice is conceived as a practical discourse. That is, the sentence, the promotion of the right to health for the children through a compulsory vaccination is mandatory, is correct, if it is the result of a practical discourse. That is, if it can be justified as rational as possible considering all the relevant arguments related to the text of the norms, precedents and doctrine, not only moral arguments. In his third work, The Theory of Constitutional Rights, second work, he advanced the thesis that rights must be conceived as rules and as principles, so like the first working that is in taking rights seriously. This is instrumental to solve the problems of rights applications. Rules are definitive commands, principle optimization requirements. The way to apply right as rules is the very well-known well -known substantial process. The way to apply right as principle is the proportionality test. On the first step, we ask whether the right infringing measure is suitable for achieving a legitimate public aim. On the second step, we ask whether the state could have achieved the aim, achieved the aim by measures less restrictive to the right in question. Finally, the third step inquires on the relation and the justification of the intensity of the interference of one right and the importance of satisfying the other competing right. That would be the proportionality test in a narrow sense. <laughs> 
These three tests answer the question whether right, right infringement is justified in the light of law. Many objections have been raised against the rationality of proportionality. It's impossible to discuss them, all of them there. For the aim of our work, we consider the intermediacy objection against the balancing process. The key aspect on the analysis of proportionality in a narrow sense consists in examin examining the justification about which of the rights in conflict should bear the actual restriction. This idea could be summarized by Alexis' law of balancing. The greater the degree of non-satisfaction or detriment to one principle, the greater must be the importance of satisfying the other. Against this approach, several critics have been raised. Among others, that balancing is a mere formal structure that does not tell us how to determine the intensity of the restriction of rights or their weight. Many attempts have been made in order to weaken the objection of indeterminacy. Alexis' answer is formal, is the weight formula. He holds that it's possible to make a rational judgment of the three elements of the law of balancing. That is, the intensity of the interference, the importance of satisfying the competing rights and their relationship to each other. For that, he developed the weight formula. In its simplest version, the weight formula contains the intensity of the interference, the importance of satisfying the competing principle, and finally, the concrete weight of the principle Okay. The key lies in the scale of restriction of the rights. This aspect is strongly reconstructive. It is based on court decisions that examine the justification that underlines a conflict of rights. Judicial decisions often make reference to light, moderate or serious interference or restrictions to rights. Hence, from the scrutiny of proceedings related to the restriction of rights, a scale of degrees was identified. Light, moderate or serious. The scale is used to help in determining the intensity of the interference. The same is rehearsed with respect to the reasons competing for the importance of satisfying the right the state is willing to promote. The creation of a triadic scale is only one step in providing an answer to the rationality objection. The second step is rather formal. It attempts to show that the classifications on the intensity of interference to a right can be implanted in an inferential system. This is the ultimate test, and for Alexi comes marked with what has been accomplished with the formalization of the method of subsumption. In the case of subsumption, the inferential system can be presented through a deductive scheme, known as the internal justification, created with the help of propositional, predicate, and the ontic logic. The ultimate test to balancing is accomplished by Alexi through the scheme of the weight formula. That is the other side of the deductive scheme. The weight formula shows that the concrete weight of a principle is relative. This is done by deferring, defining the concrete weight as a quotient of the intensity of the interference on the restricted right and the actual importance of the colliding principle. The use of quotients implies the use of numbers. From a perspective concerned with the practice of constitutional law, it has been objected that numbers are not used in balancing and that they would make the application of the test impossible. To respond to the practical objection, it is said that the use of numbers is not directed to the operator that makes the balancing. In determining the intensity of the, to the restriction of a right, the use of amounts in figures may be discarded. Alexis' response to this objection clearly shows that his strategy is formal. He attempts to develop a formalization of balancing. The third and last step in his response to the objection of irrationality returns him to a less formal arena. It is strongly connected to the theory of legal argumentation. Any inferential scheme depends mainly on answering if it does connect premises that, in turn, can be justified. The premises, including the weight formula, are expressed in figures amounts. These are plausible if supported by judgment. A judgment is such as such consists of the affirmation that the warning contained in, the sec in, in a cigarette package label about the consequences of smoking to health implies a light violation of the industry freedom of action. Here I'm referring to, a, um, to an example used by Alexi. It's, it's balancing the right to public or the, the, the end to promote public health by the German state and the right that has the German state to infringe the right of tobacco factories to uh, sell their products. And it's in this case if the, the state should ban, it's proportional to ban 
the sale of these products, so they are less controversial or less, more proportional measures that can achieve the right to promote public health. Okay, so the warning contained in the cigarette package labels about the consequence of smoking to health implies a light violation of the industry's freedom of action. Such affirmation raises a claim to correctness, which could be justified in a discourse. Hence, in this case, the Constitutional Tribunal justifies the classification based on the evidence that shows that smoking can have serious health risk. The important point is the possibility to allocate the arguments on the restriction of conflicting rights in any of the cells of the scale. This task, of, of course, is not always simple. Alexi recognizes that it might result in a long chain of arguments. He does not ignore that the resulting categorization may be open to debate, as is often happens, and seems to be customary in the practice of constitutional law. However, the discussion, the discussion does not imply irrationality, should it not only balancing but legal argumentation as such would be mostly irrational. According to Alexi, the discussion on the frame of categorization of intensities implies making assertions, and thus implying the correctness as submitting the reasons involved to debate. This, Alexi concludes, although is not comparable to demonstrability, is still a kind of rationality. Briefly, balancing is a form of argumentation as a formal structure that does not contain any substance. It's a way of clearly stating what must be justified. It's a microscope. When justifying categorization, all sorts of arguments can be employed. This repeats the connection between balancing and the theory of rational legal discourse. Here, Alexi's argumentative strategy to overturn the rationality objection raised especially against balancing ends. Alexi stands by the answer that this is a statement that requires justification. Here is the relation with the discourse and the pretension of correctness. Okay. Recently, Alexi openly sustained the connection between the proportionality test and the correctness thesis when he addressed some objections against balancing on one side and to sustain the necessity of the proportionality thesis on the other. He posed, the claim to correctness necessarily connected with constitutional review requires that the decision of the constitutional court be as rational as possible. Being that the case, then the claim to correctness of legal solution as pretension of justifiability has to be revisited. The question is, what does it mean as rational as possible when you have to solve a case about conflict of rights from the particular participant perspective? To deal with this question, we think that Alexi's theory can learn something from Dworkin's theory. From a participant perspective, it's not enough to say that the claim to correctness is only a regulative idea. It requires choosing the best justification for the solution in that particular case. The one right answer appears as the best justified answer. Here we are interested in a quite unexplored point the process of applying rights as a justification process, reconsidered from the particip participant perspective. This is what leads us to the one right answer of the working. Instead of tracing morality, thank you, in, instead of tracing morality in complex ethical theories, Dworkin presents us with actual legal cases that show the link between correctness and law in a much more intuitive way. This is because what, a theoretic, what is a theoretical assertion in Alexi, that is the relevance of the participant perspective, is understand. Is the relevance of the participant perspective to understand the necessity to account for moral or rational standings in legal practice is the starting point of Dworkin's work. In hard cases, Dworkin establishes a distinction between arguments of principle and arguments of policy in order to support the rights thesis and properly understand the role of legislature and courts. While the first usually acts on policy-oriented basis, the latter should always consider principles. By solving hard cases, courts are not acting as legislators, but enforcing legal mandates of a higher order, higher order than those enacted by the legislative branch. Thus, Judge Hercules should develop a theory of the Constitution, a theory of statutory interpretation, and even a theory on how precedents should be interpreted. The judge must treat law as a seamless web, checking every decision on what Dorkin calls the vertical and horizontal orderings. This is, in fact, what the general public expects from judges, unless we are to consider the legislative branch as above the rule of law. In fact, this thesis, the thesis of the integrity of law, I think it's paramount to understand the necessity of the weight formula. Moreover, in can rights be controversial, 
Dworkin shows in a very intuitive way why the claim to correctness is essential to argumentation, without resorting to the rigorous 22 rules and six forms of arguments of her general practical discourse and the transcendental pragmatic justification posed by Alexi. To put it in Alexi's terms, in any given hard case, there are two possible outcomes, neither of which seems to be the natural solution. What Dworkin's Dworkin points out is that even the tight judgment is a judgment that itself claims to be the right answer. However, in Loa's interpretation, Dworkin brings in literature in order to understand the function and boundaries of legal interpretation by the introduction of the aesthetic hy hypothesis. The aesthetic, the, the aesthetic hypothesis is indeed a useful metaphor in order to grasp the relative flexibility of judge interpretation of law, which includes both constraint and liberties, and also understand why each particular ruling is grounded on what the judge understands to be the best realization of the moral pr principles professed by the legal system. However, we think that this is a step in the wrong direction for several reasons. First of all, the binding nature of law seems quite stronger than the not at all binding nature of literature. And therefore, it seems quite counterintuitive to explain what the judge does in this way. Secondly, this approach, in fact, takes us farther away from actual legal practice, since, le since legal adjudication is not seen by the public as a matter of inspiration, but rather as justification. What citizens expect from a judge, especially when their claims are rejected, are more than plausible reason. When the ch what the chain noble metaphor fails to show is that when the writer chooses a certain path in order to develop another, is at the same time closing all their paths, which could be worse, as good, or even better than the other, than the one taken. As the Argentinian novel experiment Rachuela by Julio Cortázar shows, even a completed work could be read in different ways, neither of them in itself better than the other, just different. On the other hand, unless we take the skeptic road, law seems to work quite in a different way, because unlike novels, it could be and it should be constantly rewritten or corrected. Dworkin's aesthetic approach to legal reasoning fails to account for the most fundamental moral principle involved in democratic legal institution, which is impartiality. In this sense, the highest form of objectivity, at least in democratic states, that a citizen may claim in any legal norm, is a fair account of all arguments raised. In other words, the arguments that sustain the decision rendered by the court should withstand public scrutiny. Any more than this would imply a claim to a moral or political privilege for the claimant which in turn would render ineffective the principle of shared political standing among those involved in that particular legal system. But, of course, another issue arises. What should be understood as a fair account? It's at this point that the path taken by Alexi seems more intuitive than the one chosen by Dworkin. In this light, the enterprise of law is more similar than to that of science than to that of literature. While scientists submit their hypotheses about nature to peer review, Judges and legislators in democracy submit their interpretation of what, of what should be considered right or wrong to public, which in fact means peers, counter verification. Moreover, norms, especially in these days of human rights globalization, share a claim to universality akin to that of scientific assertions, not in terms of an objective set of values or truth, but in, in terms of a shared, open, and impartial verification process. As a scientific hypothesis, both statutes and, and rulings could be considered as prima facie valid realizations of the moral principles contained in the legal system, but always subjected to disproof by the adequate means, channels and procedures. For example, replacement of statutes by the legislative branch, constitutional review by the, by the judicial branch, or even change of policies by an electoral turn of the executive branch. The openness and proper functioning of these channels in order to allow the more transparent translation of the public interest into the state institution is what defines fairness or unfairness in the same way as a free and open access to peer-reviewed journals grants legitimacy to scientific hypotheses. Moreover, this integral way of depicting lawmaking, reviewing and enforcement process allows us to claim the ethical superiority of democracy when compared with other political regimes without resorting to a fixed set of substantive values. This led us to other big issue of the aesthetic hypothesis. This is more that is more concerned with entrepreneur rather than the with, the with the enterprise itself. Probably because working was more concerned with the judge point of view rather, with the, rather than with the whole political process involved in the actual life of legal system while developing. In constitutional states, 
Conflicts of rights become frequent. For example, the promotion of a right carried out through an action is interpreted as a restriction of another right. The collision can be solved applying the proportionality test. It is well known that this test is used to determine whether interference with constitutional rights are permissible, that is, if they are sufficiently justified. It allows explaining part of the practice on how conflicts of rights are resolved in constitutional state. Our point is not to go in details on the thesis of proportionality. We use it as an example to sustain that the process of adjudication of rights is better reconstru reconstructed as a process of justification instead as a process of revealing solutions. At this point, Alexis' theory has more potential. Has more, uh, at this point, Alexis' theory has more potential to reconstruct the practice of human rights adjudication. In its democracy possible here, Dworkin rejected explicitly the use of balancing to solve conflicts of rights. Instead, it is about the very different question of what morality requires. Alexis' theory of constitutional rights concedes that moral arguments play a key role in balancing. We sustain that at this point both theories are concerned with different aims. Dworkin's theory implicates a comeback to moral philosophy. He's looking forward a one-point theory that solves all the cases from a very abstract level. On the other hand, Alexis' theory of constitutional right is rather a structural one. His concern is to develop a methodology to solve conflicts of rights. That is why he used the metaphor of the microscope to refer to the function of the weight formula instead to that of a god. What Alexis is developing is an accurate instrument, or trying to develop, it's an accurate instrument to solve the problem posed by the clever but rather abstract notion, notion of law as integrity. That is why for Alexi, balancing in the framework of the proportionality test is an unavoidable fallibilistic stage. And I better finish here because... Um, well, okay. That rigorous and theoretic, though rigorous and theoretic flawless, Alexi's reconstruction of the, of the lost claims to correctness among the general framework of rationality has backfired on him, leaving many scholars, both critics and followers, to place him in the pantheon of natural law. This is why we think that he can learn something from Dworkin's more intuitive approach to the actual legal practice. However, Dworkin's idealization of judges have backfired on him too, leaving many scholars to dismiss his work as an overstatement on what legal operator could achieve. This is why Alexis' concern with rational justification of the outcome of judge reasoning in the framework of the whole democratic system is a much adequate way to understand the right answer thesis replacing Judge Hercules with, we could say, Judge Hypatia from Alexandria. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much a, las, a los dos presentadores. claro de la lectura de los textos y, y de la, la síntesis que acaban de hacer que son trabajos que, que dialogan entre sí y eh, que nos permiten eh, pensar que esta, estas diferencias eh, tan tajantes entre los dos Daría algunas preguntas al panel y, y, y tomaría, recogería algunas preguntas de, de los colegas y después les damos la palabra para que puedan. Eh. I have a question for Jacob. Um, I am, I'm not so sure that um, uh, Dworkin's approach to the clash or conflict of uh, rights could be finally understood in terms of the method of proportionality, you know? Because um, it's, it's true that um, Dworkin has been really, really ambiguous concerning what is the way to, to approach uh, a clash of rights. But I would say, and I am going to speak in my interven uh, intervention about that, that if we assume that in general there are two different ways of approaching a clash of rights. One is uh, solving this clash, dissolving the conflict by means of internal accommodation, by interdefinition. Uh, 
I think that maybe Dworkin was not clear about uh, that this was uh, his favorite method uh, to approach the clash of rights or principles or values uh, in, in taking rights serious. But in the examples, what he's doing really is trying to dissolve uh, the conflict, showing that, well, in fact, we can understand uh, both values of our rights uh, in harmony, uh, in unity, together. No? And, well, I think that if, um, um, Dworkin's view uh, is clear after that when he is trying to uh, um, approach to the idea of an integrated concept of values, no? or an integrated conception of values, saying that, well, what, what are we are doing or what we should do is try to um, understand them together uh, uh, and then it's interdefinition what we are doing. And proportionality is doing another different, uh, a different thing. Proportionality is not a question of identity of, val of values or rights and trying to uh, unify the identity of both rights uh, at stake. It's uh, assuming that they have an identity, then they have also different uh, weight, force, or uh, these, these values um, can be satisfied uh, in different levels. And then the question is to reach an equilibrium of the level, with the levels of satisfaction of these rights or principles or values. And then if we admit this distinction, maybe it's, not, it's an interpretive distinction, in some cases maybe it's not going to work, but if we admit this distinction, I think that working would not go in the direction of proportionality. It's going to the direction to interdefinition. No? Uh, Jacob, I have a remark concerning your excellent paper. I think that perhaps there is an internal contradiction in the work in theory which you do not mention. Take the, in your scheme, take the objectives incapable of justifying the limitation of a constitutional right. Excluded objectives include you said utility, preference, I take them to be the same thing. Um, this is exclusion shared by Dworkin and the proportionalists. Now, take condition three of Dworkin. A government that takes rights seriously limits rights only in cases in which the limitation furthers the suppositions on which rights themselves rest. But many rights, or all of them, if you agree with Benningham's theory, rest precisely on utility. So it seems to me contradictory to exclude utility from the set of suppositions for limiting constitutional rights. Well. <clears throat> I have a, a question for, for each of you. Uh, Jacob, your, your, your question, uh, your, your paper is quite interesting. And I was thinking uh, about uh, the situation, the, the, the border situation in which uh, a conflict, a clash of Trumps would uh, require this proportionality test. And I was... Uh, I think that sometimes Dworkin uh, says something about the fact that whenever you have, whenever you think about uh, moral standards, you have to assume some kind of uh, situation of normality. And what, once you push, and sometimes he deals with some examples like this, uh, to the extreme exception uh, the very grammar of morality doesn't work anymore. So, if you, for example, if you, if you call Carl Schmitt the, the, the philosopher of exception, um, under my view, Dworkin would be the, the philosopher of normality. So, so uh, sometimes he complains about uh, legal moralists who think, uh, what if you had to torture one person in order to save the world? Oh, of course, this is a, a complete artificial situation in which 
the, the, the grammar of morality doesn't work anymore. I was wondering if that's exactly what happens whenever you have a clash of, of, of uh, trumps. In the sense that this extreme situation would be a, a limited situation where the very root, the very grammar of this of this morality wouldn't work anymore. And it's more thing. Uh, well, uh, I have some concern about the way you criticize Dworkin's uh, literary hypothesis in the sense that I think you are taking, oh, the authors are taking more than the example really offers. I mean, in that comparison, uh, of course, Dworkin is not saying that uh, uh, literary uh, interpretation is absolutely the same as, as, as legal interpretation, and actually he makes a lot of remarks differentiating. What he's basically doing is attaching the idea of, of a point, and, and an a evaluative point that is common both to this kind of literary interpretation and, and legal interpretation. Another point that I think it's, it's, it's important too, yeah, you call Hercules a, a, a god, but actually, for actually, our Hercules is not a god; it's a semi-god, and and, and that I, I think it's a, 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 this mistake also plays a, an important role in, in the in the criticism that a paper makes uh, towards this idea that uh, well, the uh, right answer, because what what I think uh, Dworkin is really trying to do is not uh, to offer some kind of idealistic paradigm standard for interpretation of basically a very human standard, uh, but for has a limited time and limited patience in order to use the human standard. And, and, and I think that uh, in the final, the end of the text, um, when you say something about the, the, the preference for the Alexian conception of right answer. What, what I think is basically at stake here is a, a, a kind of confusion made by Alexei between the, the, the very concept of objectivity and the concept of a certainty. I mean, I think that according to Alexei, his conception of objectivity is much more linked to the idea of certainty than working is. So that's the reason why it makes no sense to, to judge Dworkin's vision about objectivity according to uh, an uh, Alexis conception of objectivity, which I think is very much attached to the concept of certainty. es para Martín y eh, es si, si este modelo de proporcionalidad si el modelo de proporcionalidad justificatorio como quieran llamarlo es, eh, solo implica proporcionalidad o eh, de, incluye debería incluir eh, otras eh, otras variables y qué perspectivas se eh, aportaría eh, amplia, ampliarlo a más, algo más que la proporcionalidad Y el segundo, la segunda pregunta para ambos es si esta tesis que parece eh, desprenderse de los trabajos, de que los dos modelos son compatibles, el modelo, el modelo interpretativo y el modelo de la proporcionalidad o justificatorio, es una tesis que es contingente a las, a las características de los estados de derecho, los estados modernos, porque reconocen eh, derechos en forma fuerte, robusta, y por lo tanto habilitan que, que haya conflictos entre derechos, o eh, esta compatibilidad es necesaria desde el punto de vista conceptual, eh, teórico, porque eh, está relacionada con la propia estructura de, de las normas fundamentales como principios. Okay, thanks very much for the questions. Mary, I'm going to take your question last, if that's okay. Yeah. I'm going to work my way there. So I want to start with Marissa's question. So uh, Marissa rightly notes that 
there seems to be a tension within Dworkin's account about how he deals with Trumps, uh, with conflicts between Trumps. Sometimes he may invoke conditions that are at least seem to parallel the uh, doctrine of proportionality. Other times he wants to um, read down the right or the opposing Trump in order to dissolve the conflict, as you put it, rather than actually um, determine what the conflict uh, itself requires. Um, I want to simply note that um, there are passages, you're right, where Dworkin does take the approach that you describe, and I actually note that in the paper towards the end. Um, that approach, though, makes Dworkin open to, I think, a very serious objection, which is that when um, clashes between Trumps come up, Dworkin doesn't take one of the Trumps seriously. So feminist scholars, for example, have been very critical of Dworkin for um, uh, recognizing uh, free speech on one side of the conflict, but dismissing the concerns of women as mere preference. And so too, in the hate speech context, people have been very critical of Dworkin for um, recognizing a right to uh, propagate hatred in one's expression um, and um, relegating the claims of those who um, uh, think the state has a duty to create the conditions under which each person can interact on terms of equality, relegating those concerns to ones of preference, not taking it seriously that there may be a Trump on the opposing side. So if that's Dworkin's way of dealing with those conflicts, I think it's very objectionable. Having said that, proportionality in its first and second conditions does some of that work because it tries those conditions screen out cases in which there isn't a genuine conflict between the competing Trumps. That is, cases in which an alleged Trump is asserted, but you can actually realize both. That's the rational connection condition. Or you can realize both to a greater extent than the, um, the government is maintaining. So I think that the opening steps, the proportionality test, after you've determined that the relevant kind of considerations are in play, actually uh, provides tools for thinking about um, whether the um, conflict is genuine or merely apparent. Um, so I think that proportionality actually takes elements of the first approach that you mentioned, but in a way that doesn't generate this criticism that Dworkin simply dismissing something that should be considered as a Trump and uh, um, uh, subjugating it to the status of mere preference or policy. Um, turning to Martin's point, Martin argued that there was an internal contradiction between the objectives that are excluded by the threshold condition and the final condition, uh, which is often known as proportionality stricto sensu, insofar as some rights, according to some understandings, seem to be rooted on the very kinds of considerations that are excluded from the analysis. And so the distinction between the kinds of objectives that can and cannot limit a right collapses. Do I have the object objection right? Um, so I simply want to notice that, uh, I just simply want to emphasize that some people have conceived of rights in terms of principle, uh, in terms of um, uh, items that are on that excluded list, uh, utility in particular. That's not Dworkin's conception of rights. Um, he consistently um, sees rights as expressions of a conception of human dignity and political equality that um, is, I think, in many ways antithetical to utilitarianism, but that would require, um, I think, more of um, an analysis of uh, the moral basis of his theory in order to develop, but I see him as an opponent of utilitarianism and so not susceptible to that objection. Finally, Ronaldo asks about um, moral standards and normality and whether proportionality is a kind of exceptional case. I want to point out first that, as a statistical matter, it's not an exceptional case, because courts from all over the world are constantly dealing with problems of proportionality. This seems to be the bread and butter of constitutional adjudication. It's um, completely ubiquitous in um, constitutional jurisdictions throughout the world, and I think that um, uh, doctrines that try to avoid acknowledging the clash generate serious problems, as my answer to Marissa. I think indicates. So what I want to point out is I, I want to reject the view that um, the clash of Trumps represents a situation in which morality doesn't apply, apply and instead insist on the view that proportionality applies the moral conditions appropriate for the clash of Trumps. Um, I could, if I were to elaborate, I think it would also be worth emphasizing these are moral conditions. These are conditions for thinking about the duty of government when Trumps conflict. And so this might also provide a way of thinking about proportionality that's very different from Alexei's structural or amoral approach. But that may be a story for another day. Finally, 
Um, Mary asks about uh, the um, status of the rule of law within this account. And there is one more uh, threshold condition that I didn't mention, which is that appears in standard forms of uh, proportionality, which is that um, in order to uh, limit uh, a law, in a uh, to limit a right in a justifiable manner, the government has to act in accordance with law. This is known as the prescribed by law objective. So there's a rule of law objective built into many conceptions of the doctrine. Um, Mary's last, the last sub part of her question is, robust rights generate conflict. Isn't this worrisome? And in the literature, there's a lot of discussion about rights inflation. I think Dworkin gets this right when he says, um, uh, if we're actually to take rights seriously, we have to make rights responsive to the reasons for having them. And if we make rights responsive to the reasons for having them, rights will often require a very broad scope. But if they have a very broad scope, we need some way of actually um, uh, understanding the duty of government when the Trumps conflict. So I think that there is a way of dealing with this, and um, Dworkin provides an instance of it, and it's an instance that we see reflected in constitutional jurisprudence um, in states around the world. Thank you. Bien. Bueno, muchas gracias por las, por las preguntas. Eh, bien. Con respecto a la interpretación de, de la hipótesis estética en Dworkin, eh, lo intentamos aclarar al comienzo del trabajo. No es un trabajo tanto sobre Dworkin y Alexia en particular, sino más bien... Eh, es un trabajo que surge de utilizar Dworkin y Alexi para trabajar casos de derechos humanos. Eh, del mismo modo que el trabajo tiene dos partes, ¿no? Del mismo modo que Alexi da cuenta de algún modo de la pretensión de corrección, de algún modo más o menos consistente en su trabajo, y la crítica que hacemos nosotros es que la forma que tiene Dworkin de encarar ese problema es mucho más simple, intuitiva y funciona mejor. Eh, del mismo modo, digamos, no, no es que la hipótesis estética de Dworkin esté completamente fallada o Dworkin esté equivocado en eso, porque es cierto, Dworkin hace un montón de observaciones al respecto cuando la desarrolla, eh, pero sí nos parece que se dirige o que confunde un poco la interpretación de la labor del juez. Nos parece que queda más claro encararlo desde la otra perspectiva, la que propone Alexi, que encararlo desde la perspectiva estética que propone Dworkin. Sobre todo porque el problema con la, con la perspectiva estética es, es la cuestión esta de la imparcialidad y la definición. ¿no? En, en, la, en el trabajo literario, eh, una interpretación puede ser tan buena como la otra y no son en sí conmensurables. Esto es algo que uno ve cuando ve el proceso completo. En cambio, si uno está concentrado en el proceso del escritor, sí, es evidente que el escritor decide una interpretación o una continuación de la novela en cadena. ¿Me explico? En cambio, o sea, la perspectiva estética pone mucho el énfasis en el autor y no nos permite ver eh, este problema. Por el contrario, la otra perspectiva que pone más el, el, la perspectiva de Alexi, que es más global en este aspecto, eh, nos parece un poco más clara porque justamente, así como un libro se puede escribir en una, un cuento, puede escribirse de un modo o de otro, y no hay forma de medir o de decidir cuál de los dos es mejor, no se supone que la ley sea esto. Se supone que deberíamos poder decidir si algunos fallos son mejores que otros o algunas leyes son mejores que otras. Parece que la introducción de, de la hipótesis estética un poco que se, se pierde este elemento. Digamos, de ahí venía el, el, la línea que desarrollamos en la última parte del trabajo. Eh, después con respecto a la cuestión de la objetividad y eh, usaste certainty en inglés la, la noción de objetividad de Alexi y certidumbre ah, ahí va, está bien eh, sí, puede ser, son dos teorías que en realidad no, no vienen del mismo lugar eso está un poco en la introducción del trabajo en realidad arrancan de partes diferentes se cruzan casi en moralidad y derecho y después cada uno va por su lado, así que tienen diferentes eh, concepciones teóricas. Y sí, la noción de objetividad como certidumbre es central en la obra de Alexi y es diferente a la que maneja Dworkin, correcto. Eh, 
De todos modos, no sé si esta distinción es tan relevante al momento de utilizarlas para comprender la, la práctica jurídica eh, contemporánea, constitucional contemporánea. Eh, con respecto a la pregunta de Mari, de si la proporcionalidad incluye o no otras variables, eh, este es un punto importante, que es un punto que de hecho queda bastante eh, oscuro o poco desarrollado en la obra de Alexi, quisimos mencionarlo cuando hablábamos de la metáfora del microscopio que utiliza Alexi para referirse al método de la proporcionalidad, que es un microscopio inflado, por decirlo de algún modo, que da todo en el tema de la fórmula, del, como que si la fórmula del peso o el examen de proporcionalidad, de las, los tres subexámenes, etcétera, ocuparan toda la escena, y en realidad de lo que se trata en Alexi es más que, es más que nada de desarrollar esto, una, una metodología de análisis que haga explícito lo que se está discutiendo. Después el resto de las variables entran, porque se trata de un mecanismo formal y después, bueno, como la lógica, la lógica no dice nada acerca del mundo real, sino que después se trata de ver cómo se llenan esas premisas. Ahí entran un montón de argumentaciones es empíricas, morales, ideológicas, culturales, etcétera, que tienen que ver con lo que se denomina justificación externa. Bien, y con respecto a la otra pregunta, si es estructural el Estado constitucional o de todo, o algo propio de todo el Estado de Derecho, me parece que en un sentido muy abstracto se aplica a todo, a todo Estado, a todo ordenamiento jurídico. Gracias, voy a tomar la... Con el tiempo previsto para esta tarde. Deberíamos terminar la... ¿Estamos bien? Entonces, la primera... Eh, profesor House, por favor. So, um, uh, this is a, a question for, for, for Jacob. It's mostly about the characterization of the approach that you describe as proportionality. Um, it seems to me uh, includes many more ideas than the idea of, of a proportionality. And so I was wondering why you, I mean, you call that overall approach um, proportionality. So there are many contexts in which proportionality is applied. I mean, certainly in international law where I work, it's applied a lot. It doesn't necessarily even entail um, a um, uh, attention or between, uh, you know, a, a right and some other kind of uh, interest. It could be just, there could be two values, there could be um, an operative provision, an exceptions provision. There's no necessary assumption that, you know, the values re reflected or defended in one are, are higher than the other, and therefore um, proportionality in that situation might not imply anything like minimum impairment. It would just, um, you know, imply that that when one tries to serve the one value uh, in such a manner as, you know, to not lose too much of the other one or, uh, or not unnecessarily lose something of the other one. And so, I mean, maybe this is just, um, you know, semantics, but, but, but maybe it should be, this should be called constitutional proportionality or rights proportionality to distinguish it from what I think is a much more general idea that is only um, a small part, actually, of what's called proportionality here. And indeed, it's in a modified form because, you know, general proportionality can include a kind of rather unstructured balancing uh, that uh, is really precluded by the, a lot of these conditions. Uh, this is also for Jacob. Um, there's two standard moves when you have theories that appear to be in opposition. One is to collapse the distinction and to treat them that they're really the same thing, and the other is to expand the distinction to create a war of uh, the incomparables. And your 
you're trying to uh, take Dworkin and proportionality in the first direction, and I have some reservations about what the payoff will be. Um, in particular, uh, it goes along two lines. The first is the types of considerations that come in as legitimate under Dworkin versus under proportionality, and Rob House just got to some of these issues by raising uh, that in proportionality we consider the institutional interests of the governmental actor. We consider not just the what's sometimes termed the rule of law condition, but the internal processes as a value that is merits some kind of weight in the proportionality analysis. I'm not sure that I ever saw Ronnie move in those two directions in a way that would credit those as being rights trumping in any particular way. But I think that the place where the distinction is most apparent is if you think about the range of judicial remedies that come from the use of proportionality as opposed to using uh, the Trump, uh, the rights as Trump's uh, approach of Dworkin. So take a couple of cases as examples. So the South African uh, Constitutional Court has to deal with uh, the constitutional guarantee of land access, of land redistribution, but it also has to deal with the illegal seizure of private lands. It's also protected under the Constitution. And its resolution is that there is a governmental obligation that must be satisfied by discourse and process values and not by compensation or by one right trumping the other in any kind of uh, simple uh, classification, very much like the Canadian Constitutional Court says that if Quebec wants to secede, the remedy is discourse and process and not an affirmation of whether or not there is a national right of self-determination there. Take another example uh, from Germany. The German Constitutional Court says that a 5% threshold for representation in the Bundestag is, uh, is constitutional because it balances the interests in political organization expression against the state interest in stability of political parties and the stability of democracy. Then the same court a few years later says that the 5% threshold is now unconstitutional because it fails to provide for the integration of the former East Germany and the ill-defined political organizations from East Germany uh, and, and guarantee them some form of representation and then comes back again some years later and says now the 5% threshold is constitutional because of the changed social conditions, political conditions inside of Germany. It's very hard to see how a Dworkinian rights as Trump's approach yields any of these outcomes. And so it's, it's not just that the proportionality sets up parts of the inquiry in the first two steps, it's also that it's directed to toward a kind of judicial uh, attentiveness to institutional detail, to societal interests, to process values that I don't think is there in the rights as trumped. Professor Michon. Um, I, I, uh, the, the question is for Jacob. I have a problem with your handout. Uh, you here are adding in condition one in the proportionality scheme, something that didn't appear at page one in your paper. You are adding um, the theme, you, you, you say you add right infringed means. And in the proportionality scheme, the first condition only requires a pure rational relationship that ends, that, that the, 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 the ends the means should um, bring the ends. And when you add this, you are changing the whole adequacy test. And also, um, in co sorry? Yeah, the, the, pro the problem is that in the proportionality scheme, just as everybody who, who managed the proportionality scheme, uh, the first condition is just a relationship, a rational relationship, where the means should achieve an end. And you are adding here right infringing means. Uh, 
But also, when, 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 when we turn in to the working scheme in condition one, you not only add the right thing, but also but the, meet, the, the pr proposed goal should bring uh, some protection for their right. Do you understand? Some, pro so, some extra protection or some protection for the right. I mean, in another words, in another words, um, for the proportionality for, for the proportionality scheme, many things might be satisfied. Many many, many measures might, might might be satisfied. Not in in the working scheme as you describe it. Because for the proportionality, the adequacy test is just a rational test. Is if the means bring about the ends. It's just that. Can I understand that's just that? What have I said that's not consistent with that idea? Uh, sorry? Um, I understand, uh, I think I agree with, like, with you about what the proportionality condition says there. What have I said that's inconsistent with that? Oh, uh, your condition one in the working scheme. You are requiring that the end protects a right. In um, I'll, I'll take your question in turn. I want to look at this more, but I'm actually not seeing it. I'll look at I'll look at this a little bit more while we talk. Okay. Okay. And our last question is uh, for Professor Levinson. Jacob, my question is a variant of Martin's, but I don't think it's uh, susceptible to the the, the response that, that you, you gave him. So my problem is with condition three and whether it um, will let in too much in effect, um, whether it'll make trumping too easy. So he, uh, he, he does hold, I mean, Dworkin, like other people who have trumping or side constraint conceptions of rights hold as kind of a first principle that a right cannot be infringed upon um, setting, a, setting aside emergency cases and setting aside some of the other cases you mentioned it, it can't be infringed upon to prevent um, violations of that very right so I can't um, uh, you know I can't kill one to save two from being killed <laughs> um, and I'm wondering and that this is kind of uh, you know this is the the, the basics as uh, as I understand when it, you know uh, as I understand the rights as Trump model but when I look at your condition three it says a government that takes rights seriously limits rights only in cases in which the limitation furthers the suppositions on which rights themselves rest but in those cases when I kill one to prevent two from being killed um, set aside whether or not the basis of the right is utilitarian or not take a non Bentham -ite approach aren't I precisely doing what condition three allows me to do aren't I precisely uh, infringing upon a right in order uh, to promote that very right. Um, so yeah, so I was just wondering how you would treat that. Okay, first of all, thank you everyone for your questions. I'm again just gonna take them um, one by one. So I'm gonna start with Rob. So Rob notes, I think rightly, that proportionality is characterized in different ways in different contexts. And I think he's right that I want to focus on um, a prominent version of the constitutional uh, formulation of the doctrine. And, um, but his question raises uh, a more um, abstract concern, which is why call these set of conditions proportionality at all? And um, one of the reasons why the question has teeth is that the final condition, which I have down as condition three, is often called proportionality stricto sensu, or um, in the German, Verhältnismäßigkeit in anger and zina, uh, proportionality in its narrow sense. And um, so there's a lot of confusion about whether proportionality refers to all of these conditions or just the final one. And um, so in the paper, I try to make clear uh, the way I began by referring to the constitutional doctrine that um, I'm in the constitutional domain and I don't want to take a view here, a strong view, on what the relationship is between the various conditions. 
But elsewhere, I've defended the view that the uh, conditions actually do come as a package. And um, so Rob uh, noted that um, you can do condition three without condition two. I actually think that um, uh, anything that violates condition two can't satisfy condition three. Um, but this is part of a broader view about the relationship between the steps. Um, I think that condition three concerns um, uh, uh, the state's duty to realize the values that underpin the rights. And um, the state isn't actually performing that duty if it's infringing rights gratuitously, which is what the second step addresses. So I think there's resources within the account to show that these uh, conditions aren't simply um, discrete items, but actually form a set in which we move from establishing the possibility of a conflict between trumps in the threshold condition to the actuality of a conflict once we satisfy the first and second conditions, and finally to the necessity of the state to respond to the conflict in certain cases by limiting a right. Now this is not the standard reading of proportionality, and um, uh, it's something to discuss though whether this um, conception would have advantages that the standard reading doesn't. Now, um, you also note that proportionality precludes unstructured balancing, and um, I agree with that, and I think the conditions that precede the application of proportionality stricto sensu introduce a huge amount of structure into the nature of balancing, and um, even the threshold condition introduces structure, because um, as Dworkin notes, uh, there are considerations that carry weight that cannot be balanced against Trump's, namely uh, objectives that are extrinsic to the relevant considerations that underpin rights. Now, um, Sam has some reservations about the payoffs of, of this approach. And um, uh, I wanna take, he had, seemed to have two reservations, so I'll take them in turn. Uh, the first one I take it was that there are types of considerations that often enter into pr what's called proportionality analysis. And his example were internal processes or societal interests. So considerations that enter into proportionality but like, would seem to be excluded by this model and by Dworkin's thought in general. And um, I agree with, with you on that point. And this goes back to what I said earlier about variation in the conceptions of proportionality. Um, this is one conception of proportionality, but there are others that differ from it in significant ways, particularly for your question. So um, uh, in Germany, for example, uh, and in other jurisdictions, the threshold condition is much weaker. Um, under the threshold condition of the Canadian approach, which I think has the strongest affinity to Dworkin's, the, um, you require an objective that is not trivial or discordant with the moral suppositions underlying rights. The German approach is, of course, weaker because they admit anything into the proportionality analysis that is lawful. So you can't have things that are discordant with constitutional principles, but you can have things that are trivial, which brings us to internal processes and societal interests. So these would be things that might be admissible in a conception of proportionality with a weaker threshold condition, but not into the one that I've said bears such a strong affinity to Dworkin. And I think that accounts for the fact that, as you say, Dworkin wouldn't be very sympathetic of what's going on in those jurisdictions. Um, with respect to the remedies, sort of going back and forth and back and forth, um, one, I, I haven't read the cases that you mentioned, uh, in particular, the, I haven't read the German ones, but I, I think that social conditions actually do enter into the analysis here, because as Dworkin notes, uh, with respect to conditions one and two, you need evidence, right? So the government, as I note in the paper, bears the onus with respect to each of the conditions, uh, including the first and the second, and that means the government has to bring evidence that there's a rational connection and that there's a minimal impairment, that these conditions have been satisfied. And so where there are changing conditions, that may change the nature of the evidence. And so too, evidence that's demonstrable in one setting may actually um, not be applicable in another when conditions change. So I think that this structure is actually very responsive to conditions, to uh, changing social conditions, and those um, conditions form an integral part of the justification. Um, so I, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Uh, Okay. Um, I actually don't see the difference that you are... Um yeah. Strong uh, test. I, I think one thing that might be getting is that I seem to have formulated the condition of the word not twice. Um, if it's condition one on the working side, 
But I think that all the condition is saying is that if you take right seriously, um, all limitations must advance okay. the trauma. And if that, if that is actually what I'm saying, if I were to clean up the knots, I, I think they're actually identical. Um, now, Jed raises a really uh, serious objection. Um, uh, and um, all I can do is sketch an answer to it, Jed. This won't be a, a full answer. But um, uh, I've talked in very elusive terms about the moral suppositions underlying rights. Um, but I haven't actually uh, said very much about those, except for saying for Dworkin, it's uh, human dignity and political equality. Um, but I think that you'd have to, ha in order to answer your question, you'd have to have some account of um, the nature of these suppositions and the duties that they impose upon the state. And um, one thing I would want to note is that um, uh, it's a common feature of proportionality in certain jurisdictions that the government may not um, infringe a right to its very core to its very core. So th I'm thinking of Article 19.2 of the German Constitution, and this actually arises more informally in other constitutional jurisdictions. And um, so the kind of case you conjure up with, with killing is um, uh, a violation to the core of the right to life, um, which is, of course, a condition for the enjoyment of any other right. But then you ask, but so is not doing it. And that's actually the issue. The issue is whether the government has a general duty to um, save the most number of people from their fates, or whether the nature of the duty resting on the supposition underlying rights um, might have uh, a distinction between um, what the government does and what happens. But this takes us into, of course, really complex problems in, in meta-ethics, but we, maybe we could talk about that at some point. Muchas gracias a los panelistas por sus excelentes trabajos, a los colegas que eh, presentaron eh, interesantes puntos de vista para la eventual formulación de un texto que sea publicado por la, por la facultad, si esto resulta posible, creemos que, que sí. Y un aviso que es que vamos a hacer una, un break eh, aquí nomás para tomar café y regresar en 5 o 10 minutos para el siguiente panel.